Okay. Okay. I'm going to ignore government debt and make the argument that the capitalism's crises have always been crises of private debt once I see the screens up there. Let's see how we're doing. I'm still waiting. I saw it down here. Let's see. Great. Okay. This is a reconstructed data set, the red line showing the private level of debt in America, private debt to GDP, and the blue line showing the annual change in that debt. This is data put together by backtracking from Federal Reserve data uh, starting in 46, going back through census data back to 1834. So the blue line shows you the annual change in debt. I define that as credit. So debt is denominated in dollars and credit, which is change in debt, denominated in dollars per year. When you take a look at that chart, you can see there have been three extreme crises in capitalism in American capitalist history each of them involving a period of negative credit, so change in debt being negative. That's the first is the Panic of 1837, which is a bit far back in history, but it's there. Of course, the Great Depression needs no introduction, and we know we carry the most recent experience we call the Great Recession. Now, if you look at the scale of what happened in private debt at that time, the change in credit, there was a violent swing from a very high level of credit for an extended period of negative credit, and that's what distinguished each of those experiences from any of the normal relatively normal business cycles that capitalism experiences. In 1837, the change was from a credit being, on an annual basis, 12% of GDP to minus 9%, so about a 20% swing around, and that period of negative credit lasted for seven years. The Great Depression was from plus 9 to minus 9, and that was an eight-year period where credit was negative for most of the period. There was a short interregnum before Roosevelt triggered it back well, what we know as the Roosevelt recession when the private sector went back into deleveraging in response to the government attempting to run a surplus. And our most recent experience uh, had debt going from, probably that's, that's got the wrong date, it's been, uh, I've got 1837 there, my mistake, uh, the Great Recession uh, starting of course in 2007, God knows why I made that typo, uh, from plus 15 to minus 6, so again a 21% turnaround and the period of negative credit lasted three years. Now, if you look at the relative size of those down arrows I've got there, that's a fairly good indicator of the relative force of that crisis for capitalism. Now, mainstream economics ignore this completely because they have a fantasy. I'm actually work, I've actually done a cartoon set uh, coming out shortly with a cartoon illustrating some of the, uh, the, the most popular fantasies in mainstream economics. And the particular fantasy here is that Private debt doesn't matter. This is quoting Ben Bernanke uh, from his essays on the Great Depression. And he did his own new Keynesian rework of Irving Fisher's debt deflation theory of Great Depressions, but fundamentally argued it doesn't matter. It's just a redistribution from one group to another. And Paul Krugman wrote most recently in a little debate some of you may have seen with me on the, on the blogosphere, said individual banks do, in fact, have to lend out money it receives in deposits. I'm delighted to say, rather than having to quote good friends of mine like Basil Moore uh, to make the case against that, I can now quote central banks, including the Bank of England, directly contradicting that fantasy and saying banks lending creates deposits. They do not lend out the deposits they've got, they create deposits by lending. And most recently, much to my amazement and delight, I can now quote the Bundesbank on the same point, saying this refutes a popular misconception now, normally when we talk about a popular misconception, we mean something the public believes the experts know is wrong. This time round, it's something most of the public has some handle on that the experts believe, which is wrong. It's time we got rid of those experts, quite frankly. Central Bank of Norway as well. Banks create money out of nothing and withdraw it when loans are paid. Now, to show why that matters, I want to give a very little simple example here of an econ economy called Tom Dick Haria. Okay, any three sectors you like agriculture, industry, whatever you quote to call it, one sector's spending is another sector's income. That's the identity of expenditure and income, which we still have not got through to politicians. And if you have Tom spending $200 per year, which is the red, the diagonal, the red on the diagonal, that becomes income for Dick and Harry. So the negative sum of the diagonal of this expenditure income matrix is GDP measured from the expenditure level. The off diagonals are the same measure by income. They're necessarily equal. So $600 of expenditure, $600 of income. Now, if you have loanable funds, so Dick lends to Tom, which is the fantasy that uh, Paul Krugman in particular uh, uh, promotes all the time, 
then I'm not going to show this going a transaction going along the diagonal itself. So Dick, rather than spending 10 on Harry and on Tom, respectively, lends that Tom to that 10 to Dick to Tom. Pardon, I'm getting my Tom Dicks and Harrys mixed up. Uh, lends to Tom, who then spends on Harry. So that's the 10 transfer of money. That's the type of fantasy that Bernanke was saying is what's involved, the pure redistribution. And of course, the reason Dick lent to Tom is he wants to get the income, which is $1 going back again. So that actually increases income to 601. It's still expenditure equal to income. Now, what's the real world? Well, that's where you borrow from a bank. And I don't show the actual bank lending on the table here, but you have a loan which increases the assets of the bank. That becomes expenditure, which is income uh, of, for Harry. So in this case, Tom borrows 10 from the bank. There is no offsetting cancellation of that. The bank is doing it, of course, to earn the income, but Tom is doing it to spend on Harry. So the extra time dollars of borrowing becomes income for Harry as well. Income for the bank as well, because that creates the income interest flow that's paid. And if the bank then spends that money back again, you get 612 out of it. So the change in debt, the credit, that matters. And that's what's ignored by mainstream economists. Now, they're ignoring data that's in full sight. And this is why it takes special blinkers not to see what's happening in the economy. Because remember, Banky said there should be no macroeconomic impact from change in debt. Well, in that case, there should be a rough correlation between a macroeconomic variable like employment and credit should be roughly zero. The blue line is credit, the red line is, uh, uh, the red line is credit, the blue line is unemployment in America. Correlation coefficient there is minus 0.91 from 1990 forward. It's minus 0.63 from 1980 forward. It's overwhelmingly obvious there's some relationship and that's what's being ignored by mainstream thinking. Equally, the same thing happens in the mortgage market. If you look at the change in new mortgages and the change in house prices, not only is there a strong correlation between the two, one thing I didn't expect to find, given the fact that Grange of causality is a very linear test, this is a highly nonlinear relationship, we found that if you did the Grange of causality test, the p-value for debt causing house price change was 0 0.003, which is fairly significant, in the opposite direction it's 0.15. So the argument is, again, statistically confirmed, which, again, I did not expect given the nature of linear statistics. Acceleration of mortgage debt causes change in house prices. You can't ignore it in the economy. You can't ignore it in finance either. Equally, the margin debt. When you look at the level of margin debt and compare that to the share price market in America, that's, that's the correlation of the absolute level of margin debt as a percentage of GDP, which is the red line, with the absolute value of the Schiller, the Schiller uh, cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio. I think you can see a relationship there. Now the causal fact, and also you can see a dramatic increase in margin debt from running at about 0.5% of GDP right up until 1995 to 2.5% since 1990, 2000. So we're in uncharted territory and it's happened under the watch of economists who collect this data. This is looking at the annual acceleration in margin debt and the change in that S&P index. Again, an extremely high correlation, which according to mainstream finance theory, Medigliana Miller, that should be zero. So we're ignoring the obvious cause of the financial volatility of capitalism. We have to reverse a mistake we've made as a result of that, of letting private debt reach levels which are simply unprecedented in the history of capitalism. The red line there is the American data I've already shown you. The blue is the British data starting from 1880. Notice that the British data never exceeded 75% of GDP until two years after the election of Maggie Thatcher and the deregulation of the financial sector. It's since it's hit 190% of GDP. Japan was the canary in the coal mine we all ignored, despite talking about it. And the euro area equally has got itself trapped in the highest level of debt it's ever had as well. That's the real cause of the stagnation we're experiencing. So we have to reduce the level of private debt. Forget about obsessing about government debt. It's private debt that matters. This is what we're ignoring. It's why we're in stagnation. So how do we do it? Well, my suggestion there is what I call QE for the people. I'm not the first person to use that title. That is the idea of using the government's central bank's capacity to create money to inject not into financial sector accounts, but directly on a per capita basis into household accounts. Those who have debt get their debt reduced. They don't actually see the cash. Those without the debt get a cash injection. Now we could use that as well and say that has to be used to buy corporate shares, which were then used to cancel corporate debt. 
So there's mechanisms we could do to use to reuse this effectively without having to cause a second or third world war, which of course, unfortunately, that's the way we reduce the same levels of debt or similar levels of debt back after the Great Depression. And we'd also reverse the income inequality that's been generated by this whole process. The private debt bubble in the first instance dramatically increased inequality. What central banks did, which was pretty much falling into their usual behavioural uh, basis of trading just for the finance sector, that actually increased inequality as well because the massive injection of government created money through central banks quantitative easing increased share prices and the people who own shares are the ones who benefited. That's a dramatic increase in inequality caused by government policy. Now we could reverse that by doing what I'm talking about which is giving that same money to the public on a per capita basis so Rupert Murdoch would get the same amount of money that I get it'd be slightly more worthwhile to me than to Rupert. Now, if we don't do that, what I think we're going to continue seeing is what we've seen for the last few years, political turmoil, because the voters are the ones who are suffering from this. Capitalism has democracy. They are not necessarily compatible. And what we've done is enhance the power of a revolt against the oligarchic system we're part of, that we call, we call them democratic, the public are telling us that unless they benefit from this, they're going to be revolting. They're going to throw human hand grenades into political theatre, which is what has actually happened. Now, partly why we've ended up getting here is because we have a theory of economics that is non-equilibrium, is equilibrium dominated and not, doesn't include debt at all. I've shown that I can simply take three definitions, the debt to GDP ratio, the employment rate and the wages share of GDP and generate a model with two possible outcomes in a complex systems world. One is that if you have a low level of desire to invest by capitalists, you reach stability over time. That's the sort of world neoclassicals think we live in without understanding the time dynamics. But slightly more aggressive capitalists mean they borrow money to finance that investment and this is the effect you get. You have a great moderation followed by a crisis. They are the same process and one was a warning of the other. We need to rebuild macroeconomics so we can see that, get rid of the equilibrium fetish that we currently have and start doing dynamic nonlinear modelling, which is possible with technology which has now been around for 50 years. I've added one more tool called Minsky. Thank you.